Uh, that's the pretty much the standard swimming pool that you'll have for any youth programming, high school or youth swim teams. That's the, the 25 yards is what they want. Uh, we also have the be beach entry pool with a, with a really nice play area, play feature area with some, some water shooters uh, for the little kids and then goes into a, a large slide, um, which we'll show a little bit more in detail in the next slide, uh, into the, the three and a half, four foot dump area. Right in that area, it's kind of hard to see from, from here, but there is a, a couple basketball hoops and also an area to put volleyball nets, uh, or a volleyball net across that, that section um, before the, the slide entry area. In the, in the large pool, the 25-yard the pool, that's a, a piece of equipment called a wibbit. It's basically an inflatable structure that goes in and out of the pool. Um, that's the, a really pl fun play feature that, that we'll, we'll look a little closer at the next slide. And that does not take any more it doesn't need any more anchors, nothing special to go into the pool. It actually ties into the, the lane lines. So that, that can come in and out. Uh, talking to Wibbit, they said once you kind of get, get it down, you can get it in and out in about 30 minutes. Um, so we can, can use it in the day and, and let swim teams use the, the eight lane pool at night. So these are the features. A better look at the slide. It's, it is a, it's a, about a three story slide. It's a, it is a, a nice slide. Uh, we did, we did um, look at a couple different options, and, and this one did seem like it was the, the most interactive and most fun slide. The, the feature of the, the kids' area has, has a nice little slide. That's, it goes into a couple inches deep as you're coming out of that beach, um, but, uh, and then some, some, water, some water play features. Next. This is the Wibbit. So it's, this is kind of actually flip, but the, the T side, the top of the T side will be on the, on the far side of the, the competition pool. There's, you can, you slide off of them. There's a couple obstacle courses, uh, just a fun area to, to jump and play and, and uh, be interactive with, with the other kids. All right, then just a brief on the project timeline. So as the city manager mentioned, right now we are in solicitation. And we're expecting contract award on September 14th. That's, uh, we're, we have bid openings on September 1st, and that will be our next available commission meeting to take it up for review. And our, our design engineer is anticipating 10 months of construction, and we're shooting to open it up for July 4th, 2021. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, uh, we will be moving to public comments. This is only for public comments. You have a maximum of three minutes. And if you're here to discuss the property off of number two road, please hold your comments at this time as we have quite a few um, items on the agenda for that property, and you'll be, we'll let you know at that time when it's fine to come up, okay? So three minutes, please give your name, your, uh, what city you live in, and three minutes. Thank you. Mr. Yes. Can I go ahead? Yes. Uh, Don Luckich, uh, I'd like just to ask uh, the city manager a question. I noticed in the last meeting the city agrees is going to pay it. Thirty-four thousand plus dollars to clean up the acoustics in this room, uh, because the room has, was basically useless. You couldn't do anything socially in here. And I was just wondering if you're going to go back against the contractor to reimburse us to clean up the mess they left with the acoustics. Yeah, the, the answer on that is no. We we don't anticipate that. We don't have grounds to. And do I that. don't understand a word you're saying. Yeah, the answer to your question is no, we are not going back on the contractor. We've had this discussion publicly before, and basically the answers are, one, the initial contract didn't have acoustics or any type of uh, materials in here that would cover the, the, the sound issues. 
and it was basically left to us to, to work on the backside. So there's no grounds. Uh, we came through and reanalyzed uh, how to do it. We made some decisions in the construction process that favored aesthetics and lighting versus sound. And hindsight's 2020 when you're building the facility. So at the end of the day, I think we came up with the right solutions. And you remember too, the, the project was about 9.6 million. And we were pretty much right on budget. I, I gave you all that figure. I don't remember what it was when we came back and at the $90,000 level to fix the acoustics. And then that came back uh, with Commissioner Hurley's recommendation. So we're, we're pretty much in the budget window. Most of what you said, because of the acoustics in this place the way they are now, I didn't understand. I'll watch it Wednesday at 5.30. Okay, uh, or Don, I'm, you can I'm always call me. But I'm, I'm just saying, the contractor just threw up speakers. Nobody gave thought to what would happen. This room, up till now, has been essentially useless for any type of social gathering, a dance or a wedding or anything else because of the acoustics that are so bad. So to me, Evergreen did not think this thing through. And in my opinion, I think they should pay to clean it up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luckage. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Yes, go ahead, please. Hi there, um, my name is Kristen Nelson, um, 2928 Tangerine Court, Leesburg, Florida, 34748. My son has low functioning autism, and we would just love to have an autism center in this community. It's a wonderful community, it's a great town, love it. He would love it. Um, so it's really all I have to say. Now I'm gonna introduce you to my friend Steve on a pro-life matter. Thank you. For Thank you. Could we keep the conversations in the back of the room and on the side down? Thank you. Beloved Leesburg Council, wonderful citizens of Leesburg, I am lay brother Stephen Gerard Sidlovsky, and I have a vacation home here. I'm sorry, madam, I'm not full-time here, I'm part-time, but God bless you all. Black lives matter, autistic lives matter, and also babies' lives matter in the womb. This banner, if you did not know, was presented last year by myself and Kristen right out on your front main street where citizens were starting to see this beautiful new possibility of life peace zones. I left the mayor a flyer and a couple of the council members and if you didn't get it, email me at brostevengerard at hotmail.com. But why can't Leesburg become a future citizen overlay life peace zone city or a pro-life sanctuary city if you will for those of you who are interested in this possibility i've already been published in the village's newspaper because i also spoke at wildwood city council uh, last february 2019. i'm delighted to educate all citizens on how we can add a new chapter into zoning law that's all it takes You've got a beautiful Christmas parade here. You got that beautiful Dr. Martin Luther King walkway here, which shows you're very big on life. And for those of you who would like to know, I was able to meet Yolanda King before she passed away when I was doing my uh, master's degree at Xavier University. And her instruction to me was, Brother Steve, help to keep my father's dream alive. And kudos, compliments to Leesburg, because you got that beautiful walkway right there of Dr. Martin Luther King. That's very special to have here in Venetian Gardens. God bless you all. I hope Leesburg becomes a future pro-life sanctuary city for the unborn. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Seeing no one, we will go ahead with the uh, agenda. Going to the consent agenda. Routine items are placed on the consent agenda to expedite the meeting. If the commission or staff wish to discuss any item, the procedure is as follows. 
one, pull the item from the consent agenda, two, vote on remaining items with one roll call vote, and three, discuss each pulled item and vote by roll call. Are there any items you wish to pull tonight? Commissioner Christian. 5C1 and 5C2. Okay. Commissioner Roebuck. 5B1. Commissioner Peterson. Uh, nothing. Thank you. Okay. Um, got so many papers here. Okay. 5B1 has been pulled. That's what I wanted to discuss. Can we have a motion on all remaining items, please? So moved, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Roll call. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Commissioner Roebuck? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Mayor Dennison? Yes. Before we start, I do have a comment um, regarding minute meetings, um, meeting minutes, and the budget minutes. Um, we're, we seem to be back to June 22nd on what, what we just approved, but we've got a lot of work to do with our budget before it comes back to us in September. When can we expect updated minute meeting minutes and budget meetings? I didn't, I didn't anticipate that we were going to have any other budget meetings and, and I didn't think we were that far off as as much work as we needed to do. I think we were pretty clear cut on where we're at. If you want to have another budget workshop or another budget meeting, you let me know and I'll get it scheduled. As far as the minutes, I'll get with Andy and we'll try to get those out to you before September. Can we get them all wrapped up by the end of the month? So we'll get everything to you by the end of this month. And then, Brandy, what were the dates for the, uh, you got a special meeting like the second Thursday for the first reading and then the final hearing, which will be your second meeting, which will be the fourth meeting or the fourth Monday in September. So if, if you want to add to the schedule, I can get a budget update in there for you for next week. I was going to come back and talk to you. If I recall, there were two points to talk about, which was health insurance going forward for retirees. Right. So I don't have information for you on that yet. That's really going to be a fiscal year 22 issue um, moving forward. And then um, there was also the write-off account that we, we talked about. And I did send the commission an email with regard to where we're at to date as of, I think it was July 31. Right. Uh, commissioners, was there anything else that you needed clarification on with these budget meetings? I know there were questions during the meeting. I think I'm good, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move ahead to 5B1. Would somebody like to introduce for you? Hello. I introduce and recommend you have a title on. <laughs> Resolution of the City Commission of the City of Leesburg, Florida, authorizing the Mayor and City Clerk to execute a construction services agreement with Advanced Commercial Contractors, Inc. for completion of the City Hall second and third floor restroom renovations for an amount not to exceed $118,702 and providing an effective date. Motion for approval. So moved. Discussion? Yeah, I, I pulled it because uh, Advanced Commercial is a Could customer. Could you move closer to the Commissioner. microphone, please? I pulled it because Advanced Commercial is a customer, so I need to abstain. Okay. And I asked for this to be pulled because I want to know what was included in the first contract. Was it only the first floor? No, the first floor contract tractor came in. I think you awarded that probably a year ago. Um, and we, we, we struggled with that contractor, frankly. Um, I think the total bid on that was about 75, 80 grand to do all three bathrooms, first floor, second floor, third floor. They started on the first floor and went 90, 120 days over their estimate. Ultimately, um, we, we, we put them on notice um, probably two or three times during the project. Um, and throughout all the warnings, uh, we finally came to a point to where we felt like, A, we needed to terminate the contract for cause, and B, they were at a spot where we could stop without any impact to the facility. So that came when they finished.
goes up to 1. So how much, what are you pulling from other projects? And so you're about 50 over budget. So, so termination of the contract, change of the contracts costing us about 50 grand. However, uh, you know, that's bad, but next low bidder when we redid it was in that ballpark too. So if you didn't go with this contractor, you'd have been spending about the same amount of money. So what this contract does is it brings in a new contractor we address some design items, and upon your approval, we'll get back to work wrapping up the second and third floor. If Is you opt not to do this and just scrap it, you'll throw about 70 grand back in the, in the hopper, and you'll have first floor done and second and third floor not done. Is there any way to recoup some of the overages from the first contractor in penalties? I think you're, it, it, you know, I, I understand wanting to be aggressive, but I think you have to meet aggressive with what's realistic and what you're going to spend in legal fees and chasing down. So it comes back to beating blood out of turnip. And yeah, maybe you can get a couple bucks. Maybe you can go in with this contractor and have some performance issues, but you're going to pay Fred more than you are chasing down the contractor. So for $50,000 to get on with the project time, and money and getting the project done, you're just, you're better off moving forward. Roll call, please. Uh, Madam Mayor, can I ask a question? Yes, definitely. Kind of piggyback what you're saying, Al. So from the city standpoint, how we um, eliminate them from bidding on future city projects for a time? Yep, they'll, they'll be blackballed. Um, they, they fail to perform. They won't get good reference checks. And obviously we won't use them again. And we have some procurement policies that goes into how we react. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Roll call, please. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Mayor Dennison? Yes. Okay, we're moving to 5C1. Would somebody like to introduce, please? I'll introduce and ask to be read by title only. Resolution of the City Commission of the City of Leesburg, Florida, authorizing the Mayor and City Clerk to execute an agreement with Ski Beach Restoration LLC under the terms set forth in Exhibit A attached here to for the purpose of financing impact fees for a restaurant at Ski Beach and Venetian Gardens, setting forth terms to include but not be limited to total dollar amount to be financed, number of years to be financed, interest rate charged, methods of repayment, and providing an effective date. Motion for approval, please. Move for approval. Second. Any discussion? And I um, actually, but it's before, um, just by being on the council and having some um, previous history with impact fee financing. So maybe it was for Fred, um, what is the city's remedy if the um, restaurant um, goes into bankruptcy? I saw we had something in there, but what is the city's real remedy if something happens and there's no payment? Essentially, to sue the defaulting LLC. I had put a guarantee clause in the agreement, but I noted when I signed the one in the stack of documents that nobody's name had been put in there. So I'm assuming that this was done without a guarantee, which means you have just the LLC. Its assets probably are limited to the restaurant, so effectively your remedy is nothing. The, the upside of that is it's the city's property. If they default on that, it probably will trigger a default under the lease also. Okay. So the city gets that back and you start over with a new person who so moves in and has impact fees to pay. So if they had a, a million dollar bank loan, what position would be in? Would it, would it matter with us owning the property? Well, the bank loan will be against their leasehold interest okay. and against the equipment in furnishings and fixtures they have in it, not the land or the building. Okay. So the bank, and I haven't seen the bank documents yet, but I'm assuming that they will have the right to step into the lease, most banks do when they lend on one, and cure the default okay. and keep it going. Okay. And somebody is gonna owe those impact fees when they get a new buyer in there. Okay. So the LLC, um, but no guarantor, you recommend that or should they have a guarantor? On I have always been leery of these arrangements for that reason, that you have no deep pockets 
to reach into if there's a default. That's what we've run into in the past. Right. Um, that having been said, this one is fundamentally different because the city does own the real estate and has the lender back stopping the lease who will want to put a new tenant in there. Okay. And the new tenant is going to be in the same position. The one silver lining, if you will, is that the property is vested in impact fees only up to the amount actually paid. So if the use requires $50,000 worth of impact fees and they've only paid 25, somebody's going to have to cough up the other 25 okay. to open a new restaurant in there. Okay. Thank you, sir. I, I just want to clarify. I think, Fred, can we tie it to, can we default the lease or could, can we at least try to draft a, a ground lease where it's a default if they default on impact fees? Or? That would probably be rejected by the lender. Okay. Okay. I follow you. I've, I've never known a bank that would loan on a lease and accept a condition like that. Well, yeah, we're just we're just forcing them to pay. It's all we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, thank and you. Like I said, they're going to have to deal with it on the back end because right. their new tenant's going to have to cough it up, or they'll have to pay it to get that person in. So somebody is going to pay that balance, unlike some of the other places where the bank foreclosed and wiped out the whole field. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Oh, do we know what our actual cost is to run the water and wastewater to this particular facility? Up. Yeah. Cliff, do you know that number? He didn't hear. Do you know what the number was to hook up the restaurant over here to water and sewer? Do we have that number? The, the impact fees? I no, do the, not have the actual cost. I do not have that cost. I can get it for you. Yeah, we can get it. For, we don't have that one. Okay. I think on, on future, um, this one uh, I, I'm okay with because we own the property. But on future ones, if we could also know what we're actually out of pocket, because sometimes that and the impact fees are not the same. Sometimes they are. So that would be useful. Roll call, please. Commissioner Roebuck? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Mayor Dennison? I'm sorry, I can't agree with this because we keep sticking our neck out. We don't protect the city enough. We don't have all the information. So no. Okay. 5C2, would somebody like to introduce, please? I'll introduce now, it's to be read by title only. Resolution of the City Commission of the City of Leesburg, Florida, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute a memorandum of understanding with Renee B. Morse for funding of custom services at Leesburg International Airport and providing an effective date. Move for approval. Second. Thank you. Discussion? Uh, I pulled this one as well. Um, I was trying to get more information, trying to figure out. I know we talked a, a few weeks ago about the uh, renovation that we city would be responsible for. We talked about other people who use the airport um, internationally, their contribution. Um, so I see the villages are giving 55, up to $55,000 um, exclusive use to one of the, the rooms. So I'm just I'm trying to figure out uh, total cost um, that's going that the city's going to pay to renovate the building, or uh, any other partners who are going to who use for the international uh, flights, and do they get used to an exclusive room? And so I see something where it says the agreement is terminated. We give 108 day notice and also. Um, I think it was number two, the city shall pay an additional cost which exceeds the combined total of reimbursement provided by the villages. Um, so does anybody know, have an estimate on what the cost above the 55,000 the city will be responsible for? Okay, let me, yeah, so there, there, that br Sorry. <laughs> breaks down to about four questions. So if I miss any of them, let me know. Um, the FAA informed us probably about 12 to 18 months ago that we would need to make certain improvements to the facility, the customs facility, which housed in Sun Air, to make it compliant with Homeland Security standards. The, we spent about 30 grand to get these um, improvements designed, and we put that plan on the shelf until the pending outcome of the situation. So the situation was then interrupted by a few things. N number one was, was, was COVID. 
and suspension of the international flights. So um, when that happened, we also, when COVID also happened, we also had the notification from the FAA that not only did we need to make improvements to the facility, they would also be increasing the operations cost to run customs. Since customs has been at the, the airport, the annual cost for that has been a total, an annual total of about 125,000. The city and the villages entered into an agreement sometime back uh, that the villages would pay that full cost, 125,000, and whatever user fees were accumulated from customs, that they would get that reimbursed. The, the user fee to pop in, fly international, stop in Leesburg, and then pay customs, uh, it's a sliding scale, but that number's not very big, from 200 to 500 bucks, depending on aircraft. That's probably an annual income that the villages gets reimbursed, $25,000 or so. But between that reimbursement fee and what the villages pays, we had the existing agreement that the, the customs cost for operations is covered. So now come COVID, now come improvements that we need to make, um, and now come the FAA saying our operations costs are gonna increase. In response to that, we put in a grant as well as airport cash, and we always anticipated making the, oper the capital improvements to make the facility whole as part of an airport cost. That's budgeted, that's ready to go, that's on the shelves. We struggled with the increase. So the increase is the difference between the delta between the 125 and the 175. We're not sure exactly how much that delta is gonna be. We estimate that it'll be between 175 to 200, so the increase could be anywhere to 50 to 75 after all the talking and that we've done, and the, and the difference in there is overtime cost for the FAA if they have to call somebody in to bring somebody in and do their, do their thing. So in the process of all of this, we did an examination of who the big international travelers are. And I would say we get about 900 flights or 90 flights a year that go international. About 25 of those flights are villages and about 25 of those flights are Renee Morris. So um, we got word out, we had the discussion with the commission that we didn't think that it, um, continuing and absorbing that difference was reasonable for the airport. That would have been you know, between around a $50,000 hole in the bucket, um, and that wasn't a good financial move. Uh, so I instructed Tracy to see what she could do to fill the hole in the bucket. Uh, and the first person we went to because of their major user was Renee Morris, and Renee has volunteered to fill in the gap. So the MOU uh, provides that, that firm commitment, and then if we go over that firm commitment, she, she will consider whether she'll fill in the gap. We think that the amount that she's put in the MOU should cover the cost. If it doesn't cover the cost, we feel like we're in a position where, you know, if we're only talking a couple of thousand dollars, it's worth it. Uh, maybe, a, maybe around 20% of the international flights are other than those two categories. So that's a reasonable cost to absorb. If it gets more than that, the MOU allows us to go back to, to Ms. Morris and have her increase that cost. So we thought it was a reasonable deal. Uh, we have until the 14th to notify the FAA uh, whether we want to resume customs once the COVID stuff is suspended. So pending the outcome of your vote, assuming that you say yes, we'll notify customs. We'll get the date on when some of these suspensions will be lifted due to COVID. And uh, we should be in a, a position to open up international flights again. And then we'll move forward too um, with the, the improvements to the facility. Last thing you asked about was exclusive room. I'm, I'm not sure about that. Most of the uh, exclusive room, I would, you know, the Villages has their own hangar. Renee has her own hangar. The other international flyers have their own hangar. So I don't know what the exclusive room is. 
so no, it's all actually month seven says Morris Powers will be permitted to utilize room 106 in the airport management building. Morris may make improvements to that room and shall have exclusive use of it for as long as this agreement's in effect. So whatever room 106 you know what is. is. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear the question. You were talking about the room in the manager's building? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the Renee's chief pilot has been asking about that room uh, ever since it was vacated by Whip Air. They had it complimentary. They were using it for storage. And uh, I was uh, sort of putting it off because I really didn't know how to approach it. I had talked to you know Fred once about maybe how we put together a small agreement. But I also felt that although nobody had ever asked for office space, as soon as we decided to rent it to someone, then maybe other people would come out and say that they didn't have an opportunity to get an office. So um, it was a surprise to me that it was written in there, but it sort of, I was going to approach the situation in the future regardless because he had already inquired about it. Renee does not have a hangar, she's at Sun Air Aviation. And so this would be for the use of her chief pilot um, and secondary pilot to keep her records and have an office. Essentially, it's the quid pro quo for 60 yeah. days. Well, I was about to say $50,000. I mean, somebody else wants an office, they get $50,000. We probably can build them an office, but they don't have one on there. So that, that was just my question. Someone else came and asked for an office. Are we going to say if you get 10, you get an office, or is that the, uh, I, the, where we are? So that was just, that was just my it's only. It's still a good deal for the city. Yeah, and, and thanks, Tracy, uh, for reaching out and Al for instructing her to go out and, and fill the hole for $55,000. So that was, that was my comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. I'll just say that, because I, I knew the, the whole discussion was about two people, and, and they are the, the major users now, but yeah, being that we have other people to, to pay for it, uh, I think you can't really understate the importance of having customs for the future growth of Leesburg. It makes it a more attractive area for companies and for people moving to the area. So while we don't have the people using it right now, I, I think this does benefit a, a lot more than maybe our discussion tonight made it seem like. Thanks. Roll call, please. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Commissioner Robuck? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Mayor Dennison? Yes. Okay, moving to public hearings and non-routine items. This was 6A, would somebody like to introduce, please? I'll introduce and that's to be read by title only. Ordinance of the City of Leesburg, Florida, annexing certain real property consisting of approximately 1.57 acres, being generally located south of Rogers Industrial Park Road and east of County Road 33, as legally described in sections 14 and 15, Township 20 South, Range 24 East, Lake County, Florida, providing that said property so annex shall be liable for its proportionate share of the existing and future indebtedness of said city, providing that such annex property shall be subject to all laws and ordinances of said city, as if all such territory had been a part of the city of Leesburg at the time of passage and approval of said laws and ordinances providing that such annexed territory shall be placed in City Commission District 3 and providing an effective date. Motion for approval, Move please. Move for approval. Second. <laughs> Discussion. Okay, this is to take uh, the property for the fire station that is over in Okahumka, which will now be Leesburg. Roll call, please. Commissioner Roebuck? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Mayor Dennison? Yes. 6B, would somebody introduce, please? I'll introduce House Bureau by title only. An ordinance amending the comprehensive plan for the city of Leesburg, changing the future land use map designation of certain property containing 1.57 plus minus acres from Lake County Industrial to city of Leesburg Institutional for property generally located south of Rogers Industrial Park Road and east of County Road 33, as legally described in sections 14 and 15, Township 20 South, Range 24 East, Lake County, Florida, and providing an effective date. Motion for approval, Move for please. Approval. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Commissioner Roebuck? Yes. 
Mayor Dennison. Yes. 6C, would somebody introduce, please? Introduce and recommend and read by title only. An ordinance of the City of Leesburg, Florida, rezoning approximately 1.57 plus minus acres from Lake County CFD Community Facility District to City of Leesburg P Public for property generally located south of Rogers Industrial Park Road and east of County Road 33, as legally described in sections 14 and 15, Township 20 South, Range 24 East, Lake County, Florida, and providing an effective date. Motion for approval. Thank Se you. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Commissioner Roebuck? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Mayor Dennison? Yes. Okay, we're moving on to 6D. This is the beginning of the Macaulay property. <coughs> Somebody like to introduce, please. I'll introduce how to read by title only. An ordinance of the City of Leesburg, Florida, annexing certain real property consisting of approximately 4,900 square feet, being generally located south of County Road 48 and west of Number 2 Road, lying in Section 18, Township 20 South, Range 25 East, Lake County, Florida, providing that said property so annexed shall be liable for its proportionate share of the existing and future indebtedness of said city, providing that such annexed property shall be subject to all laws and ordinances of said city as if all such territory had been a part of the city of Leesburg at the time of passage and approval of said laws and ordinances, providing that such annexed territory shall be placed in city commission district three and providing an effective date. Motion for approval, please. Move for approval. Second. Okay, discussion. Just to let you know, this is only to bring the property from Lake County into Leesburg. Okay, discussion, please. Anything from the audience? Um, Dan Miller, Planning and Zoning. Uh, this evening, there are three cases in front of you. The first one is the annexation for 4,900 square feet. The one after that is the small-scale comp plan, also for 4,900 square feet. The next one under 6F will be the one that everyone's here for, the 165 acres uh, for a PUD zoning. So with that, uh, we do have, if you would like, you, Your Honor, uh, Ms. Sarah Meyer from Dewberry Engineers could make a presentation on this. That's fine, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Sarah Meyer with Dewberry, 800 North Magnolia Avenue, Orlando, Florida, here on behalf of Hanover Land Company for the Macquarie Project, and I am gonna Take this off. I'm okay, take the this mask off. is coming off. Thank you. Um, um, before we get started tonight, I just want to um, say that I was sorry to hear about Commissioner Hurley. I know that we all wish him a full and speedy recovery. Um, so it was October of last year that uh, we came here for first reading for the annexation, the comp plan, and the rezoning. So it's been a good 10 months since that's happened. So because of that, I'm going to go through the full presentation again. Sorry if it's lengthy, but I do tend to talk quickly, so we have that in our favor. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. So with us tonight with um, the development team is Ben Snyder, Tony Iorio with Hanover Land Company, um, and Christopher Allen is the project engineer also from Dewberry, and our traffic consultant is Traffic Mobility, and we have Iman here. Um, they'll be happy to answer any questions that you have at the end of the presentation, if you have any. Hanover Land Company is a full service company. They do real estate development and home building, so they can see their projects through from beginning to end. They have the full resources for that. They've been in Central Florida for over 35 years. Um, and in the last five years alone, they've done over 22 projects, totaling more than 7,000 lots. Specifically in Lake County, they've had projects called Artemore Reserve, Cypress Oaks, and Preserve at Sunrise. And again, if you have any questions about their developments, I'm sure they'd be happy to, to discuss those with you. And it's always nice to mention that they are a very charitable organization, giving back to the community when they can. So as Dan mentioned, the three applications are for an annexation and a comp plan, which is only for 0.11 acres. Uh, the remainder, the last agenda item for this property is a rezoning, it's a PUD, and that is for the full 165 acres for the whole project. 
This just gives you an idea of where the project is located. It's the yellow outlined property on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, the general area has Highland Lakes neighborhood, the legacy of Leesburg neighborhood as well. Uh, we're bounded on the north by County Road 48. Uh, no problem. To the east is number two road, and then a little further west past the um, two larger subdivisions is US 27. This just demonstrates the future land use. The majority of the property, which is outlined in red there, already has the estate future land use within the city limits, and that allows up to four units per acre. Uh, that's what all of the property in this area within the city limits has, is that estate future land use. To our west is Lake County limits, and that is an urban low designation, and it's also four units to the acre uh, within the county limits there. The zoning in the area, uh, we're asking to go from R1A, A, and R1 to a PUD zoning district. As you can see, it's pretty compatible um, with that area. There's PUD to our west, PUD to our north, um, and then number two road sort of provides that sort of man-made density barrier where the, the development sort of um, comes to an end there. But you can see the gradual progression of the PUD of residential neighborhoods as they progress from US 27 to the east to number two road. So with each comp plan and rezoning application that comes to the city, there of course has to be an, anal an analysis and evaluation that is done. Um, we submitted our analysis with our applications and then the city performs their own independent analysis and that's included in your agenda packet, um, staff has done, and it does recommend approval for all three agenda items. But it found that the project is consistent with the city's policies and regulations, both the comprehensive plan and the land development code. The project is compatible with the surrounding areas. The requested PUZ zoning district, it does allow for flexible standards, which results in a compact neighborhood design and an increased wetland preservation, because there are a, a few wetlands on site. And any impacts um, that are identified as a result of the project to public facilities will be addressed through the already established concurrency management system that's in place today. The project provides a mix of lot sizes, neighborhood amenities, and a large amount of open space and buffering. And then the housing that will come with the project will definitely help fill a gap in what we call the primary housing inventory for this area. This is a recent aerial of the property, 165 acres total. Uh, it's currently used for as an agricultural operation. If you can see, the southern majority of the property has planted pine trees that are regularly scheduled for harvesting. They have an agricultural exemption for that. There is no forested woodlands, conservation, or protected habitat on this property. There's also no historical structures or landmarks uh, identified with the National Historical Registry for the property. We have already completed a listed species survey and it did identify some gopher tortoise burrows which will be relocated prior to construction and in accordance with the appropriate regu um, regulations. This is our specific PUD plan for the property. We have a maximum proposed units, I'm sorry, 542 units, all single family detached homes, a mixture of lot sizes including 40, 50, and 65 foot wide lots. Overall, that brings the project to a gross density of 3.3 units, and that's consistent with the estate future land use, which allows a maximum of four units per acre. Um, our 40-foot wide product is located internal to the property. Uh, our 50-foot wide product is located throughout, both internal and along the perimeter. And our larger product or lot size, the 65-foot wide lots, are specifically located on our western property boundary, adjacent to the neighboring subdivision, which is Highland Lakes. Over a third of the property, 57 acres, is um, maintained in open space and recreation, 35% of our 165. The requirement for a PUD is 30%. So we are exceeding that minimum requirement. And within that 57 acres, we're including a neighborhood amenity, a pool and cabana, uh, neighborhood parks located throughout the project that will be connected through a sidewalk system, buffers, and green spaces. Some of the recreation uh, park uses could include playgrounds, gazebos, tot lots, a dog park, and of course, we're a fan of 
open grass area for unstructured play so you can kick a soccer ball around and have, have room for that. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but there is a, um, like a brown colored that goes around the entire perimeter of the property, and that is our buffer tract. It's a minimum of 25 feet that goes around the entire property. Uh, it can go up to 50 feet in a couple of areas, which I'll point out in just a moment, and also have a six-foot fence in a couple of areas that I'll, I'll also get to. But it goes around the entire property, even though we are adjacent to some very similar uses, we have that buffer tract there as a requirement um, and in um, adherence to some of the city regulations. Now, there are two differences that um, between this plan that you're seeing tonight and the plan that was here in October, and that is um, at the bottom there, I have it outlined. It's the access point to County Road 48. Originally, it was at sort of the midway point of the frontage along County Road 48, and it is now shifted to the west, to our western boundary of 48. And the other difference is our access point onto number two road, which used to be at the curve in number two road, sort of halfway down, and it's now been shifted north, uh, closer to the intersection of number two and County Road 48. Both of those changes were directed to us by Lake County as they own and maintain those right-of-ways. Um, and we have been through coordination with Lake County and with the city engineer um, to have those changes done and implemented in this plan. So focusing on the open space and buffering, like I said, 57 acres of it. Uh, we do have wetland preservation on the site as well, 4.14 acres of wetland. There are no springs, creeks, or streams that run through or are located on the property. We have the 25-foot perimeter buffer that will include landscaping, uh, canopy trees, understory trees, and a continuous hedge. Adjacent to Highland Lakes on our western property boundary, the buffer tract over there will have the six-foot high opaque fence uh, in the buffer tract to provide additional screening for that neighborhood. Um, and I want to mention uh, that we have gone through great lengths to design this neighborhood and lay it out in such a way that our ponds are actually, majority of the ponds are located on the perimeter. And that is to provide increased separation and buffering from the adjacent properties. So we have buffer tracks, we have open space tracks, and we have stormwater ponds located as much as we can along the perimeters uh, to provide that additional separation. And we also are adjacent to County Road 48 and Number 2 Road, which again provide ad additional density barriers. Zooming into our eastern boundary, this is Number 2 Road, just, just giving you a clearer picture of those stormwater ponds. It's the darker green um, surrounded by the sort of lime green color. Um, you can see that we really have very few lots that actually back up to our property boundary. The majority of it is open space tracks, ponds, and even some of our internal roadway systems. Uh, the properties in this area are either vacant or being used as agricultural operations. There is one single family home across the street, across number two, um, and it's not directly adjacent to us, but we do have ponds and open space tracks at the closest points to that single family home. On our western boundary with Highland Lakes, uh, we have our larger 65 foot wide lots located on this, on this perimeter. We have the 25 foot wide buffer. And that middle graphic, if you can look, the property boundary does like a jog out where it almost doubles in width. And there's a great opportunity there as we get into final engineering and grading and drainage to evaluate that and hopefully provide up to a 50 foot wide buffer something we're really looking at and we hope to provide. So there's the opportunity there to double our buffer in that particular area to 50 feet wide. But if you look back at the, the graphic on the left, you can see the large stormwater pond on the north corner and the large stormwater pond on the south corner. So about half of that property perimeter is in open space and stormwater, um, just doing the, what we can to provide that additional separation from the existing adjacent neighborhood. There's also he heavy vegetation and tree canopy in the rear yards of most of those lots within Highland Lakes that will provide additional screening. These are buffer cross sections of the, that property perimeter we were just looking at with Highland Lakes. The top one is that 25 foot wide buffer that we would be providing. There's an existing buffer within Highland Lakes in this area and it's 20 feet. So together you're gonna have a 45, 45 foot wide buffer and a total of 73 feet of separation between building structures. And the southern 
southern graphic, sorry, the bottom graphic there depicts the area where the property boundary jogs out and there's the potential to go up to a 50 foot wide buffer. I do want to point out that Highland Lakes does not have a designated buffer tract in this area of their property, uh, but they do have a 35 foot rear yard setback for their homes in this area. Overall, if we can get up to that 50 foot buffer, we would have um, more than 100 feet of separation from building structures from property to property. The elevation and plan view of those buffers, um, this is what this is showing. For every 100 feet of the buffer tract, we would have two canopy trees, three understory trees, and a continuous hedge. The opaque fence is also shown in this, uh, this graphic, just depicting what would be provided on that western boundary. Of course, we analyzed traffic. Um, we did submit our traffic impact analysis and it's been reviewed by Lake County and the city, which was the, uh, why we had to change those two access points uh, that I pointed out earlier. The study was for a four and a half mile study radius. It did determine that the roadways had sufficient capacity. Uh, there's the potential for an east right bound turn lane, I'm sorry, eastbound right turn lane may be needed on County Road 48, and a westbound left turn lane may be needed also on County Road 48. But at this time, it's not likely that we will need a left and right turn lane on number two road, and it's not likely that there would be any proportionate share mitigation needed. So we're still working with them. That will be finalized, I believe, through final engineering. Um, but it, I mean, the new roads will increase connectivity and provide alternative routes when needed. This is not going to be a gated community. So if there's traffic emergencies or traffic congestion, um, access, these additional access points would help um, alleviate that and of course increase traffic safety. Any, any roadway improvements that would be result of this project would help increase traffic safety as well. Thank you. Uh, this is a rendering of a neighborhood amenity that Hanover um, has done before in some of their neighborhoods. It's really well done and it's really well received by the residents who live there. You can just barely see the tot lot and playground um, beyond the cabana building. Um, so just, just to give you an idea of what this may look like. This one just shows the uh, conceptual home elevations that they're proposing with the project. The PED ordinance does include specific architectural standards and guidelines that we must adhere to when we get to final elevations, uh, but these, would, these are just conceptual renderings demonstrating what some of those architectural features and standards would look like. So now that we've gone through the specifics of the project, I thought it would be um, beneficial to everyone to just sort of travel back in time for a moment. This is an aerial from 1941, and as you can see, there is little to no development in this area. Um, you've got 27 on the left and number two road on the right. County Road 48 um, is our northern boundary there. Um, so you can see there's very little development in this area. There's a large wetland system running through the majority of this area. And if you guys can't really see it on these screens, but most of the upland area has agricultural operations on them. There's rows of planted crops. So this is a heavily agricultural operation area. So this was in 1941, and um, I believe it was in the early 70s that Florida adopted its first zoning law. So it was at this time that people started to say, hey, growth is coming, we need to plan for this, we need to have zoning rules and zoning laws in place. And so in the early 70s, we adopted our first zoning law in Florida, and then in the mid 80s, I believe it was 1985, uh, Florida adopted what we now call the Growth Management Act, which requires all local municipalities and cities to adopt their own comprehensive plan that would guide growth on the local level, to plan for it, to have policies and regulations that guide that growth, um, and to guide it, not necessarily restrict it. So if we fast forward to the early 90s, um, the 2000s, and today, you can see how all of that planning, how those policies and regulations have helped to shape this area the majority of that wetland system has been preserved, so it's working. The plans and the effort that everyone has put in again, is working. So majority of the wetlands are preserved. There are some impacts um, for road access, and there are some lots that encroach into the wetlands, but majority of the development has incurred on upland property, and it's been done in a way consistent with policies and regulations that have been put in place. And if you 
just continue to look further to the east, you will see that the proposed project is a seamless continuation of that same development pattern. And um, so we're just looking to you know, be evaluated and analyzed on the same policies and regulations for all of the developments that have come before us. We have very few wetlands on our site, but the ones that we do, we will adhere to the, you know, what the regulations are for development. So to dial in and go to a more, go to a, you know, more defined neighborhood level analysis, uh, the circled areas will, I'll, in the next few slides, I'll show you at a neighborhood street level how we are similar to what's already out in this area, uh, specifically highlighting Highland Lakes because they are the neighborhood that is uh, directly adjacent to us. So within Highland Lakes, and these couple of snapshots are from the property appraiser's website, you can see that there's a mix of townhomes, which is an attached product, 44-foot wide lots and 65-foot wide lots, all within the same blocks or surrounding blocks of each other. There's also townhomes um, directly across from single-family homes. So a variety of lot sizes within close proximity to each other. To me, this is actually good neighborhood design. And it's exactly what Hanover is trying to do as well, provide a variety of lot sizes, 40s, 50s, and 65-foot wide lots. And what that does is it provides a variety of housing product for um, different households, because not everyone needs the same type of house or can afford the same um, you know, lot size. So it speaks to a larger demographic of people, and it provides that necessary um, mixture. Again, just another example within Highland Lakes, we have duplexes, we have 44 foot wide lots, 80 foot wide lots, all within this one neighborhood. Um, and just to point out the lower graphic there, it, it is uh, one block over from our subject property where we are actually proposing uh, a large stormwater pond there and our 65 foot wide lots. You can see that's where the planted pine is typically harvested right there. So it's just one block over from 44 foot wide lots, which is not much different than the 40 foot wide lots that we are proposing. So a lot of similarities, a lot of consistency and compatibility. Um, really the only measurable difference that I can think of to mention to you tonight would be that our project is not a gated age restricted community. It is a, intended to be a neighborhood for primary housing where you can purchase a house at a competitive market rate. So anyone can, is welcome to purchase a home there. P working professionals, working families, houses, households looking to downsize, and even retirees. And it would, this is a growing area. Uh, I know that people love to work and live in the same area. They wanna live in the area they work in. And so this project would help fill that gap in the local housing inventory. I mentioned in, in October, but that was a while ago, so I'll just mention it again. The Bureau of Economic and Business Research at the University of Florida, um, their last report that was published on population and growth uh, identified Leesburg as growing by over 3,000 people in the last eight to nine years, which is a 13% growth in population. Lake County itself was ranked eighth out of all of the counties in Florida and I believe there's 65 counties, but I might be off by one or two. Um, so they were ranked eighth for percent change in population in 2010 to 2018 reporting period. So it's growing, the population is growing, people are coming here, people wanna live here, and, and they should be able to live here and work here at the same time. Um, so going back to the evaluation, uh, the, the applications, all three applications are consistent with the policies and regulations. It's compatible with the neighborhoods and the development pattern in the area. Majority of the future land use is already in place. We're just looking for that zoning designation to allow for those flexible standards. And over a third of the site in open space and recreation. Um, you know, we've gone to great lengths to try to lay out the neighborhood in consideration of the surrounding properties and to provide a, a quality project. Um, I know that staff supports our project and they recommend approval, it's in your agenda packets. So we hope that you too will support the project um, and vote for approval tonight. Uh, thank you for your time, sorry it was so long. If you have any questions, be happy to address them. Person in the back, I see a hand waving back there. If you could come up to the uh, podium, please. I do have a question. Um, we are going to be next to a uh, pond. 
Will there be a fence between the pond and Highland Lakes? She mentioned between houses and Highland Lakes. Um, oh, and we have, we're on Borg Street across from this. She mentioned the smaller lots. We have a 125 foot wide, 120 foot wide lot. And the other thing is the water from there, there's a pond, you know, the ponds, will they run south into the Highland Lakes wetland? So those were my questions for her, thank you. Could the person from Hawthorne come back, or Hanover, come back to the uh, podium, please? My name is Christopher Allen. I'm also with Dewberry Engineering uh, at 800 North Magnolia Avenue in Orlando. Um, I'm the engineer of record uh, for the future development. The ponds will, uh, the pond in question, uh, next to this woman's house will di likely discharge to the east into the wetland, uh, so not directly south. Uh, it will retain the water to make sure that it maintains the pre-existing drainage patterns, which is where the, the part of that uh, site currently drains to. I think Sarah is actually looking up to answer her other question about the fence. No, we've proposed to only have a fence located in the buffer tract where we have a lot adjacent to an existing lot on the neighboring property. So it would not block the view of our stormwater, um, our stormwater area. Yes. A six foot vinyl fence won't hold back much of the noise pollution that's gonna come from an extra 500 houses. I would much prefer to see a sound barrier, much like you see on the side of the road. I need my quiet. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening, uh, my name is William Mendoza. I live in Yalaha. I'm an emergency physician at Lisburg and uh, the villages. I'm extremely concerned about this project and I have several questions. The first one is the environmental impact that this will produce in the parcel of land. Who has accredited, who has the reports of the impact of this project, the monumental size? Uh, the other question is regarding the traffic, the vehicular traffic, uh, I said that a uh, study was performed. I personally would love to see that because as it is today, it is extremely congested and adding 550 new residents, that will be a minimum of 750 vehicles per day moving in and out on a Highway 48 that is already choked east and west, east towards the highway in the hills and west towards 27, it will impact gravely the mobility of all the residents of the area. The other question I have is regarding the study of uh, the environmental impact on the south shore of the Lake Harris, our beloved Lake Harris and the aquifer. Those retention ponds that I call just storm retention ponds usually seal the bottom of what the water is retained. So there will be no more natural percolation of water into the aquifer. There's gonna be a tons of fertilizers used in those lands, and those will end up being running off into the aquifer. There's thousands of people in that area, Yalaha, and whoever is just down south from there, that use that aquifer as a potable water for consumption, and that will be impacted. Uh, those are my main questions, and uh, when it comes to the uh, explanations, or I have something to read. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So in regards to the stormwater ponds, typically uh, stormwater ponds only need to be sealed uh, in the bottom in areas where there is not a higher water table. 
Uh, if you'll notice on our rendering, some of the ponds were green and some of the ponds were blue. Those were based off of uh, our assumptions uh, about the existing water table. Uh, so the ponds will not be sealed at the bottom. They will, will still percolate into the ground. Um, and we will still be required to permit through St. John's Water Management District uh, and St. John's Water Management, Water Management District currently requires reduction in nutrient removal uh, prior to discharge uh, and through a handful of different methods. And so we will still abide by that, uh, maintaining the current discharge rates for the nutrient removal. Um, and likewise, St. John's does require us to uh, analyze um, any wildlife impacts uh, and wetland impacts and we will still permit through them and abide by their criteria. Uh, and Mohammed uh, Abdallah from Traffic Mobility Consultants is here and he can answer the, uh, the questions about traffic. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mohammed Abdallah, uh, Traffic and Mobility Consultants and uh, regarding the gentleman's uh, uh, question about transportation, we, we had done a complete traffic analysis for the project, which, as, as you heard earlier, was reviewed by the city, the county, and the MPO. Uh, the, the findings of the analysis, County Road 48 uh, basically has a uh, capacity of uh, 950 cars in the peak hour. Uh, with the project, will be well below that capacity. Uh, as far as number two road and, and, uh, and 48, the intersection is, uh, as, as currently uh, laid out, uh, will be operating within its capacity. Obviously, there's another main entrance to this community which shares the load. So uh, there, there's really no major capacity uh, change that will happen. We will have access type improvements, turn lanes, making sure that movements are safe and adequate in and out of the community. And for the motoring public, that will be part of this project. Are these reports available to the gentleman who asked about them? Absolutely, yes. Uh, Could you get together with, with him and give him the information, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Knowles. Good evening. I'm going to keep my comments very short and leave as quickly as possible. I've spent many a day sitting where you gentlemen are, so I, I don't miss it at all. Uh, I am a 20-acre neighbor of the Hanover Project. I have the property that's on the southeast side. I'm also on number two road. When this project was first initiated uh, over a year ago, I was very curious. I'd never heard of Hanover. I've heard of Hanover Shoes, but I'd never heard of this development. And so I very carefully and deliberately went out and looked at some of their developments. And um, I noticed that they were quality developments, very nicely built. And if uh, this is the product they're bringing to Leesburg, I've always encouraged Leesburg having good, wholesome, clean growth. And this looks very nice. So I have no objection to it. And in fact, I'm probably in favor of it. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Knowles. Yes. <laughs> You're next. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christine Brothers. I live in the Springs, which is just a little bit west of Number Two Road. Uh, the Springs community has been there since the 1950s. It's a quiet, lovely little place. And we have our own water system, which consists of the Blue Spring and spring water. And all the residents there appreciate and enjoy every single day that we have there. What I want to know is where are these people going to draw their water from? Because we depend on that spring. It's in all our homes. We have a lovely uh, natural swimming area. We have a, uh, a beautiful aquarium canal that's natural, untouched. And it's almost a pristine community. It's quiet and full of all different types of homes, big, little, and we all get along, we're all neighbors. I wanna know how this is going to impact our water supply. We don't want any kind of Leesburg water. We love our water. It's the best water in Florida. And I wanna know about how this is gonna impact the trash, the noise, 
the crime and the garbage that you're going to no doubt see along the road. Thank Would somebody you. like to answer the water issue, please? So the project's actually extending the city of Leesburg's utilities uh, to the, the site. So we will be drawing our water from the city of Leesburg, uh, both water and wastewater. There will be no on-site septic or uh, wells allowed on-site. So, so that, that's what then those amounts would be within the, the CDP that we have. And we've got about two MGD of, of um, water availability. Okay, I think the question is, was, will there be any impact to the, uh, the water in the wells that the community, the springs, pulls from? Without knowing the specifics about her community, I can't say definitively, but uh, that's really more of a product of how the city of Leesburg draws their water, not necessarily uh, how our specific community uh, draws our water, because we are taking our water from the city utility department. Would the lady who just asked that question, would you get together with that gentleman and fully explain what you were asking? Because I don't think you got an answer. <laughs> well, she got, she got an answer on the water part. The, the, the water part, which is you know, the, the critical issue, is it's coming from the city, which is in the city's existing CUP. So it's a resource that's already been allocated and more water other than what's already allocated is not being drawn out of the aquifer. It's already been reserved for the city. Okay, I think she's talking about insecticides and, and the ve vegetation and everything else okay. with chemicals going into the aquifer. Okay, this, this question is for the traffic engineer. Um, you said Could that we have your name, please? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Terry Blessing, and I live just a few miles down off of number two road. Um, I'm in possession of what the county has done for the traffic. And my question is, you had said that there would be no or that the county has been in contact with you all regarding number two road. And I have their analysis from Seth Lynch in my hand. And there's not been any other traffic impact analysis that I am aware of other than this one. And on here, you did not include number two road in your tra traffic impact analysis because tra Seth says so. He also has asked um, specifically that you justify the traffic distribution on number two road, that you verify the reserve trips for the subdivisions that are included in the traffic volumes. There's discrepancies in the total number of lots for this PUD identified, and that t the, a TIA will need to have the most recent PUD concept plan. So my question is, how can we, how can you stand here and talk about that? So there must be something that you know that I don't know regarding number two road, because I travel it every day. Uh, to, to directly answer your questions. I think the comments you're reading were from their review of our methodology. And then based on that review, we completed a study and submitted that. So in our study, we do address some of those comments. Uh, we do include number two road in as much as it's required to be included heading north to County Road 48. So the analysis does uh, look at that. There's an engineering part that you know was discussed on how we accommodate access on number two road and what needs to happen around the access, which which has been preliminarily addressed and will continue to be detailed out through the engineering process. So while those I've seen those comments and they're valid, we've addressed them to the extent uh, in, in the traffic study. So those are you know, predating the final version of the study. Mrs. Blessing, could you get with him and get a copy of the new study? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 
I'm Susan Post and I live in Highland Lakes on Racket Circle. I'm also on the board of directors and I notice there's lots of people here from Highland Lakes. We have a lot of questions. I hope I can get them in in three minutes. Um, we have a lot of wildlife in our backyards, a lot of wildlife. I'm wondering what concessions are gonna be made for them. Also, who's going to maintain the 25 foot buffer that falls on the Highland Lake side of that fence. Um, 25 feet is just really not enough space between the homes. Um, what about the school district? Does Leesburg have enough student room in all the schools to take care of 542 students? You're not gonna have 542 students and yes, there is no population problem with the Leesburg schools. Okay, good. Um, and looking at the map up here, it appears that the smallest lot homes are going to be the ones that are directly behind Highland Lakes. Am I not tr right on that one? No, that the, the 40 foot homes are gonna be internal in the center with the larger lots surrounding. And so those lots will be maximum of 65 feet yes. wide? Yes. And what is your schedule on building? Well, first of all, it's got to pass all the, uh, <laughs> the legality issues. And Hanover, when can you start building? And that's the section that's on 48, that backs up to 48, correct? So we can, Ben Snyder, Hanover Land Company, we can start development on phase one, which would be our phase one, as soon as the construction plans are approved, which is the step after this step. Okay, how quickly do you think you'll sell those homes? Um, I know Windsong is still trying to sell lots, lots of lots. And I think Hanover, are you not the one that wants to put in the additional homes along 27 behind the golf cart uh, repair place? And those will be also very small homes backing up to Highway 27. I drove down 48 for 11 years because I worked at Waterman. And I can tell you that the trucks, the amount of trucks traveling on that road is just unbelievable. From the dump trucks to the construction trucks, uh, that road was resurfaced not too long ago and it is a mess because of all the trucks driving on it. For, I've lived here for 18 years and I kept thinking, one of these days they're gonna widen this road to four lanes because trucks use that road. Coming in from 19, they scoot through Howie in the Hills, not Howie in, you know, Howie in the Hills, to get over to the toll road. So those roads have a lot of traffic, big traffic not just cars. Thank you. Excuse me, did you say you were, which development were you from? Highland Lakes. Oh, okay, I, I thought I heard something else. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, my name is Harry Brothers. I'm a 31 year resident of the Springs. I'm very concerned about the environmental and wildlife issues. Um, I would like to get a copy of the environmental study that was done, if that's possible. And I would also like to know who has the ultimate say, yay or nay? People I'm- You mean as to. far as whether this goes ahead or not? Yes, ma'am. It would be this commission. Okay, can I get the names of everyone on the commission? If it's I may? available on websites, on the city website. You're welcome to all that information. Leesburg commissioners, correct? Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. By the way, uh, Hanover, if you want to discuss with this gentleman where the environmental survey is. Okay, this gentleman back here will help you. Uh, Mayor? I'm sorry, uh, Mayor? Oh. I was just going to suggest, because a lot of people are asking for the environmental and, and traffic study, that maybe we could get it and throw it somewhere on the city website so yeah, everyone can just idea. get it. I mean, they're welcome to get it here too, but. Something's good for us to have as well. Right. 
Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Israel Ramos. I live on number two road. Um, I'm actually about a mile away from there. And my biggest concern is us making the same mistakes that we've made over and over again since we came into Florida, because they're talking, and I've seen it on number two road in several different developments. It's happening down on 48 now, where they go in there and they just strip everything out, and they just create this barren desert where nature can't be there, and you've got existing trees there. You're talking about 165 acres that basically don't get very much human activity in there. And in the 20 years I've lived on number two road, we've seen Sherman fox squirrels down that road. They didn't mention anything about Sherman fox squirrels. We've seen gopher tortoises, and without giving you a, a, a ecology lesson, gopher tortoises make holes in the ground that provide homes for a wide array of, of different animals. Scrub jays, we've seen them in the area as well. Nobody's talked about uh, bald eagles and the need that they have for large oak trees and, and uh, nests, which we've seen on our property at, at, at many, many times just down the road. Um, I've seen whooping cranes. I've got pictures of whooping cranes that, that come on my seven acres with our dogs that are on the property. They come there. We don't know that they're going to those 165 acres with all of their wetland area in that area. I've seen rosette spoonbills out there. I've seen bears out there, coyotes, bobcats. And, and I know what they're going to do. They're talking a good game right now, but they're going to come in. They're going to level everything. They're going to change all of the, the wetland area and put in their ponds, their retention area, their green space with no regard to these guys. And they were there first. <laughs> Bottom line. And, and I don't care what they say about chemicals. We are on limestone. We are all interconnected. Our pond, when we bought our property, was bone dry. And after the hurricanes, the water rose up, and that, the fish, the animals, they all come up. Everything comes up from the ground. Everything goes back into the ground. And I guarantee you there's springs on that property. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Natalie Hagen. I am third generation owner and resident of Springs Community located on County Road 48. My family built there back in 1973. Of course, I've seen some changes, but, it's, but none as dramatic as what I'm seeing now. Urban sprawl and the continued extension of the villages and now pop-up communities like this put existing community residents' basic needs at risk. Water quality will be affected when deforestation occurs. Our community and others rely on, on, on this water and its quality for drinking, bathing, laundry, cooking, and swimming. We have a right to clean water. The current plan puts that basic need at risk. In addition, this spring feeds into L Lake Harris. And in 2017, the county undertook the several million dollar project to install drainage systems with filter boxes to filter groundwater before it enters the lake. The deep forestation in new homes are, rem and are removing a natural process that is at no cost to the county or its residents and helps ensure that our drinking water is clean and natural. We spent millions on filtering just groundwater and now destroying the water that comes into our homes with no care, no plan. We already went over the water quantity, so I'm skipping over. The traffic on County Road, 40, County Road 48 is a two-lane highway. We currently have seen an increase in traffic compared to 1973, of course. But continuing to build new communities on this road poses some safety issues. The ability to enter and exit communities in a timely and safe fashion, longer commute times due to increased volume, increased probability of bottleneck traffic at 4827 intersection. This already occurs due to drivers turning into Walgreens as well as res residents of Hawthorne turning north into their side entrance. With increased volume traffic in both directions, the wait line for turners will increase, thus backing traffic up into the intersection well beyond the lifetime allowance. This equals accidents and gridlock. Crime. The demographics of the general area as well as the springs has changed dramatically. With that came more crime and trespassing. By installing lower income housing, the community we, uh, housing community, we, we are looking at the potential of even more crime more often. The current municip municipality that services our area is county, not city-based. That being said, the response time is at least 25 minutes for an officer to get to someone's home. We also have one small fire station on, on 48 that services the entire area as first, as first responders. Another basic need, our safety is at risk. Food and retail. 
With the current population, the two closest grocery stores already need to stock on a daily, daily basis. Even before the COVID outbreak, shelves have been depleted and stocking has become, a daily, has become daily in an attempt to keep up. Very few are going to travel 15 to 20 miles to a different store when the closest is only three miles or less away. I will conclude with this. The development, if it goes as planned, shows sheer inconsideration and neglect for the ignorance of the basic needs of the existing residents and its wildlife. If any of these alterations lead to the harm or sickness or of any resident or the extreme lowering of property values, then you put yourselves at risk of a civil suit. Thank you. Thank you. David Sirdar, 66 Winter Green Drive, Fulton Park, Florida, 34731. You know, I'm, uh, it's candidate season, and uh, I'm worried about the earth and the environment. And I may be appointed by the governor to the St. John's River Water Management District. Sir, and we're talking, I, a, we're well, talking water, about a specific development. You missed well, your opportunity earlier. Well, you may be taking part of the water of the natural resources. And you may be taking some of the property that, well, there is a lot of land in Leesburg. It's a large, large city. And, you know, I just came from the Lake County School Board meeting and public comment is there. I, I've been public commenting we know. at Ocala. Um, they took a vote on maps. You know, I'm, I'm everywhere. It's, it's voter time and voters have a right to be here. And this is the USA. I'm from Libertyville, Illinois. I'm a certified commercial cleaner, and I've taken action. Sir, you're using up your three minutes. Well, I just want you to know that, um, you know, butterflies and life goes on. And sometimes development uh, needs to slow down a little bit, and some people have the rights to complain. But, you know, I'm worried about our kids' future. And... I know that a lot of reporters don't put real stories out. They admit they just have a job. I work with Senator Baxley directly. I was just with him. I've run for office before out of Libertyville, Illinois, out of Lake County. I'm from Waukegan. I had my own business. You know, I've been to Marion County. You know, I'm a great golfer. My son's getting to Tiger Woods, but I've been to Tallahassee. Aides of the governor have come to talk to me. I put an application in for 18 counties for the St. John's River Water Management right here and i did it well i just got awarded by jerry devins july 7th the orange county mayor's pit and buddy dyer replaced another one there was a city council meeting in orlando today you know don't tell me i wasn't a candidate for lake county water authority i didn't do my qualifying hey you know you folks are special we are all special we all have our rights you know all lives matter you know, we're the land of the free. This land is our land. Home of the brave. America the beautiful. You know, only, in my book, only trash litters. We got to take care of the environment. No buts about it. I mean, I work. I just called the governor's office. I have the numbers and props. Lexi Botswana, the first lady's aide, external affairs. And people have their rights. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I mean, Saturday, I was with Joe Grunners. Thank you, sir. Your time is up, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question about the traffic Could study. we have your name and address, please? Yeah, uh, Jim McDonald. I live in the Legacy of Leesburg development. Um, my home backs up to 48, so I'm very familiar with the traffic on 48 on a daily basis. What I was wondering, did the traffic study take into account the uh, comparable development that's opening up down the road toward, toward 27? It's going to be 
I, I don't I don't know 300 houses I'm not really sure what that number is but it's a it's a comparable development and if it didn't take into account that additional traffic then I think it needs to be redone thank you traffic study from Hanover did you <laughs> did you include the new community that's currently being built behind Lee's uh, legacy so when when we do these there are different communities that are being approved or contemplated at the time and what we do is instead of taking specific communities and plugging them in we look at the growth patterns and we include a growth rate so it has been included but not by name the effect of it has been included and that is the typical way that we we, we look at how traffic grows over time and we capture that and we put it in the background and then we work on top of that so okay. yes it has been but not specifically by name okay while you're standing there the city of Leesburg wants copies of your studies okay the traffic study the environmental study and all the other studies that have been mentioned here tonight and we will put them on our website so they'll be available to everybody Absolutely. thank you yes. Hey, don't name Zed Williams from the Highlands, Highland Lakes. Um, I got nothing against Hanover uh, properties. I've seen them. They're great. I hope the gentleman makes a billion dollars next year. The only problem I have with is the venue. He's building mixed-use houses right next to senior citizens. It's a bad formula. It's not going to work. It's just, just a fact. It's just not going to work. Now, if, if, they, if he still wants to make money and put senior citizens housing in there, maybe get some kind of a venue, not a venue, a uh, permit where he can get access to 27 and relieve some of that traffic off 48, number two road, that might work as a senior, senior citizens complex. But as a mixed venue, it's not going to work. And I, I know this deal is already done, and it, it's, all, it's basically over with. But you guys got to live with that. So remember that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Carol Wilhite, and I live in Highland Lakes also. I'd like you to consider denial or postponement of this project at this time. It will give the city and commissioners time to review and insist that modifications are in place to be compatible with the existing communities that fall within the boundaries of Leesburg and address concerns for the environmental impact and safety concerns for existing communities as well. Project as it currently stands does not comply with the laws and regulations regarding the use of the land within current guidelines to be compatible to similar communities bordering the project. The economic and environmental impact is hugely detrimental as the project now stands. It is asking for this development to be larger in size recommended for the area. Proposed subdivision entry is on a small rural road and would severely impact traffic flow and create concerns for both fire and police access, not to mention the increased traffic on SR 48. The lack of public transportation would increase the traffic flow by approximately 4,000 trips a day and the cost to the city would be more than the revenue generated. Environmental impact concerns me the most as it will deplete the natural forest habitat of many of our local endangered species, as well as the natural water flow of our wetlands and its inhabitants. Our forest helps protect our water flow and acts as a sponge to absorb the water and allow for slow re release to preserve the quality and flow of our water source. Removing our forest land would cause depletion and would severely affect both the quality and quantity of our water systems, as well as increase the temperature of our lands, causing further hardship and distress on our land and the environment. Part of the attraction to Highland Lakes was to enjoy the wildlife and natural settings that it had to offer, as well as the increased lot size so we could feel that we could breathe within our community. My understanding is this new development would not be compatible to the existing communities and would need to be compliant within the current regulations in order to move forward. We would ask that this project be postponed as it fails to comply with the fundamental smart growth principles. 
and could be reviewed when they are able to comply with such and are to be consistent with local laws, cities, regional plans, and current existing communities. Possible solution would be to adapt smart growth principles to preserve our open spaces, our forest, farmlands, and the environment by insisting on a 10-acre, 200-foot wide forest habitat conservation preservation buffer for the two existing wetland areas adjacent and east of Highland Lakes. This would include prohibiting removal of trees and not allow regrading of the area within the conservation buffer area or along number two road and to replace the existing perimeter fence unless the sufficient barrier is in place. Secondly, to have public transportation in place as well as to have sufficient bike and pedestrian walkways be approved and maintained and the number of houses based on acreage size to be compatible with existing communities. We understand that growth needs to continue, but we must use smart growth recommendations in order to preserve the integrity and good use of land within our communities. Thank you for listening to our concerns and hope that we can work together for the betterment of our communities. Thank you. I'm sorry, I forgot that, to mention something before. My question is, is there really a need for that, that many houses in the area? Because Hanover's building a second phase at Whisper Pines across from Pear Park, and they're still building on the first phase. And Lake Denham is just now finishing up their building right down the street on 27. And then there's that large development that they just cleared out all of those, those beautiful trees right there on 48, and they're gonna put in another 300 there. So I don't see the need for that. My wife's been driving into Orlando for 20 years, not because she needs to, but because we want to live out here away from the city. That's why people come out here. And, and one, of, one of the commercials for Lake County is come see our nature, come see our, our waterways. We're building over everything and we're making the same mistakes that we made with the Everglades back at the turn of the century, just clearing everything out and nature, it's gonna, it's, we're going to pay for it later on. Thank, Thank you. you. Jason Thompson from uh, the Bloomfield subdivision in Yalaha. Uh, when you start your project, how long until you conclude building the houses? That depends somewhat on market demand and absorption, but generally uh, neighborhoods of this size absorb between six and eight houses a month. So you project that out over the life of the project and you can do the math. Okay. Uh, Le Leesburg doesn't have a great track record on finishing subdivisions or holding contractors accountable. Uh, the one across from Legacy that goes up Everglades Way, that has a couple hundred homes, uh, sites, and there's about 12 homes in it, and it's been that way for about six years. That was because of a con coming out of New York. That wasn't, that wasn't uh, Leesburg. Okay, uh, second question is uh, if, if you do have good standard of homes, I, I did research that, if Sir, could you speak into the microphone, okay. please? Sorry. Uh, they do make good homes. I, I, did, I did go around like the one gentleman that uh, has a property adjacent to him. But we are in a very crucial, uh, critical area in our development. And what if they're not able to fulfill building those type of houses? And you have s several subdivisions that are like that where you have very empty lots and then a different contractor comes in and puts in substandard homes just to fill up the lots and then everybody's uh, home values go down. I moved to Yalaha because it's uh, more of a uppity up uh, neighborhood. I wouldn't want to live next to Section 8 housing. The individual that has a house on uh, the property adjacent to him, he probably likes it if it's all good homes, but if it was a Section 8 housing next to him, I'm sure he'd say, no, I didn't want you to uh, build there. These That's are 250 to 300,000. I don't think they're going to be Section 8. Well, there's lots of subdivisions that they didn't complete. And well, then, I only and know of I the have... one on 48. Which ones are you speaking of? No, I'm just saying in general in Lake County, there's several subdivisions. Not in Leesburg, though. The only one, and that's Yalaha, that's not even Leesburg, that that road 48 is on. And the uh, person out of New York was doing a con. So okay. that's Yalaha. All right, but that's Leesburg. I just looked it up. City of Leesburg, Everglades, subdivisions, Leesburg. 
And I would say that that's the whole reason why we, we do PUDs is because there's restrictions on what can and can't be built there. So if the developer goes out of business, the PUD restrictions still remain on the property. They don't go away for someone new. So um, that, that is the, the safeguard you have there. Is there anybody else that'd like to speak? Carolyn Northcott, recent uh, resident of Highland Lakes. I've only been here five months. I don't normally get up and speak, um, but I can listen to everybody's concerns here. I just moved here from a beautiful other area of Florida. Why? Because of the same kind of thing. I chose Leesburg because everybody's friendly. The lakes are beautiful. I chose Highland Lakes because of the beauty of the heritage trees, the walkways, the greenery, the respect for nature. So I have looked at Ardmore Reserve, I've checked things out there. They are making beautiful homes, but they do, like this gentleman said, bulldoze everything down, which is such a sad shame. I would hate to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we kind of moved past questions. Um, I'm Terry Blessing. Uh, one thing that I just wanted to, I want you guys to know, I am for growth. I am not against smart growth. But recently, I live off of Number Two Road, and I have met um, at least one of the commissioners out there to show them what I think. But the reality is, we've had two properties sell along Number Two Road recently, actually three. Um, there are 66 active pending homes that uh, land, vacant land or houses in the neighborhood. My thing is, is that with all of that's happened, I'm a retired nurse practitioner, I'm worried about health, I'm worried about children, I'm worried about them having a place to play. We don't know what's gonna happen on our school districts, we just don't know. I think that there are people moving here, two of my neighbors have moved here from Orlando. They are trying to escape mass houses on top of houses. They're trying to escape density. I am not against a home or a PUD, but I would like to see that density reduced. I would like to see the houses spread out because that's what we need right now. We need to spread out and the children need a place to play. As much as I do think the homes look nice in the housing development, I have also toured Hanover's homes, but I will tell you, you put a car on one side of the road, you put a car on the other side of the road, there's barely enough room to get a car down the middle. With kids trying to play outside, my biggest concern is we're trying to get kids outside because as much as they're doing home studies, they absolutely have no place. This Hanover development would be great if it was transitional. Let's entice people to move here from other high density cities, even if it's Claremont, I mean, Claremont is high density. I think there is an opportunity for the city of Leesburg and it's just not 500 homes. I, again, I wanna reiterate, I'm not against development, I'm not against growth. So I really hope that you guys can think outside the box. We need those studies and thank you for allowing me an opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mrs. Blessing. Hi, my name is Lori Howell. I live off of Number Two Road. Um, I moved to Orlando in 1991. In 2002, I moved to Claremont. In 2008, when I saw the tops of the hills coming off of Claremont and houses in place, I said, I got to get out of here. I moved out to Howie in the Hills, and that's just my story, but there's an entire population like me that wants to move out. They want to be out in a way. I'm not against progress either but there has to be a time when progress is not as associated with money as it is a better quality of life. Progress should be about a better quality of life. And if we can get the density down so that people have room to breathe, it could actually be a great turning point, I think, for Leesburg, because it's gonna now be known as the place where you can go and have a little bit more than you're gonna get in Claremont or you're gonna get in Orlando. Thank you, and um, not to be cheeky, but I study number two road every day on my way to work, and you can't tell me that 500 homes are not going to impact the intersection of number two road and 48 to the point where it's not gonna need help because there's people that bicycle on that road, there's people that walk on that road, 
and you can barely get two cars side by side. If I've got a truck coming this way, I know I'm going up on the side of the road. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs> I'm Kristen Hughes. Um, I just wanted to check and see, did each of the commissioners get a copy of the video that we had created and send out? Were you able to take a look at it? Absolutely. Um, thank you. I appreciate your time doing that. Um, found myself with a partner in Legacy who's a voter, uh, and he had a little drone. And he uh, was interested in collaborating with us to try to tell the story of this project. And that video in 14 minutes, I think, does a pretty concise job. I'm a 40-year uh, veteran. As a, I'm an AICP certified planner. And I've got 40 years experience developing and designing land in many in four states. Um, I've been very interested in Leesburg. I moved here to retire a year and a half ago because of your zoning ordinance, believe it or not. Uh, the city of Leesburg has a really nice ordinance. Uh, you have PUDs in your ordinance. And what got my attention was that you had a very effective language that restricted the development in such a way that you were required to follow smart growth principles, which I'm very familiar with because I helped create them in Maryland in 1993. I forwarded copies of those 10 principles which have become widely accepted around the entire country and which you all accepted in your law uh, by reference. Um, the ordinance is entitled, your ordinance is designed to create a new tool for the commission, the council, to be able to approve innovative and flexible design that would enable you to balance public interests, things like open space, recreation, environmental protection, public transportation, affordable housing, against private property interests, which are what Hanover is here trying to exercise on behalf of the landowner for, the pro for their property. Both are entitled to those, those rights and privileges. By adopting the PUD ordinance, you've, uh, you've accepted the responsibility, which is a heavy one, to figure out how to balance those different objectives. I'm not going to go into the full litany of what smart growth is, but you've heard a lot of it tonight in the testimony from people around. My main concern is the first thing on my list, which is preservation of the environmental sensitive lands that exist on existing property. And the basic principle is allow growth and development but do it with the existing nature and land that's there. It's not a project that under the law of the city of Leesburg should be allowed to simply tear all the trees down and regrade and then build back up. That's contrary to your law. It's a fundamental principle. Um, and I frankly believe that if anybody does proceed with that kind of an approval, the city will be very ripe for challenge under, the, under those just that one principle alone. Another part of my career was affordable housing, and I managed to work as the executive assistant and legislative director for the Secretary of Housing for the state of Maryland for a number of years. And I care about people having a way to get a house and to get into a home for the first time and to have reasonable, affordable rentals. And your law, under the principles of the PUD that you adopted, calls for, through the smart growth policy, the provision of a wide range of available housing types and, and prices. And if you do a smart growth project, you are required and supposed to follow smart growth policy that says you provide a wide range of housing types and prices. So what we found out in Maryland when we did this is you can do that in a very high growth, high income, highly desirable neighborhood simply by requiring that a project include up to 5%, maximum 10% of really affordable housing by a variety of mechanisms, and I won't go into those. This project presents itself as an opportunity for that. So if you're, if you're serious about affordable housing, require the developer to provide 5% of those units to look just like the other units that they're getting, but, but to be available through various programs for, affordable, for, for low income, and middle income, low middle income people. And that's very, very doable in this project. The other side of this income range 
is high-end income, which is missing in this project. This is a transitional area, as you heard some people say, and it would be totally conceivable to build a project that includes a, a segment of percentage of units that would be $300,000, $500,000 on one end, $100,000 to $150,000 on the other end, and the largest section in the middle could be the units that they're talking about building, which frankly are the modern suburban uh, cookie cutter type housing. The reason Hanover can afford this project is because they're doing the same project types that they're doing in thousands of other units all over central Florida. Sir, they're, could you start not, wrapping up, please? Your time is up. Thank you. I'm, uh, I want to ask you to do two things. Please do a natural buffer, 200 feet wide maximum. That would protect Highland Lakes and preserve the environmental issues that we're talking about today. And second, um, have them redo a traffic study that really makes sense. They haven't gone broad enough. They focused it in just at the neighborhood level, and they have, been, they have ignored the large-scale impacts on 2748 and down in the other end by Yalaha. Thank you. Sorry, I just needed to clarify. This section was just for questions or our comments, or is the comment section coming after? It's all together. So would you mind if I? Well, you've got three minutes. You've already been up once, so go ahead. OK. So uh, the changing of the zoning of uh, this project will give the green light to the project to our vastly impact uh, the south shore of uh, Lake Harris with the aquifer and the habitats in there. The environmental studies, I really would love to see those environmental studies in writing and who are the authors of those studies. All right, we said we were going to put it on the Leesburg website as soon as we get them from okay. Hanover, so you will see those studies. Uh, the proposed project uh, and the delineation, there's not a percentual proportion. She mentioned this 35% uh, buffers and green belts, but the 25 foot wide is not enough. It's a tree and a, and a bush. Uh, the transportation will be badly impacted, so we don't have to talk more about it. I know that if we add 500 plus houses there every morning and every evening, it's going to be at least 300 more vehicles coming in and out at that intersection of Road 2 and 48. And I don't know what happened. And finally, moving ahead to rezoning those land parcels will be opening the gates for a complete devastation and an impact on the residents in the area and in the environment. It will impact the environment that is delicate and we don't know what happened to Lake Harris and the aquifer. The vehicular traffic will become unmanageable. And there is only one final comment I wanna make. This project has been created with the insatiable greed of unscrupulous developers with the purpose of making possible the biggest profit for them and their shareholders without any consideration or regard for the environment, the transportation of the community, and the well-being of the residents. And to add, we moved from Destin, where it used to be really good and open. It became a cookie-cutter area. We moved to Leesburg looking for a more expansive and clean area. And now are we becoming, again, one tight space. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Miller, would you come to the podium, please? Thank you. When we originally had this back in October, the Planning Commission voted against it. What is, is the that situation is with that right now? When it originally came back in October, staff recommended approval of the plan. It went to the Planning Commission. Planning Commission recommended denial. The reason they recommended denial was based on the density, overall density number, and the concern for number two road. Right. Okay. And that has not been fully addressed to handle those concerns. A traffic study right. has been done. Another one or an update of the existing one will need to be done because normally traffic studies and environmental aren't done until the development stage. Um, but it, it will have to be updated. 
um, if they get to the development stage. And um, so that's, that's what will happen to happen on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, commissioners, did you have any questions of Mr. Miller? Uh, I said I said one, Dan. Um, originally, um, right now, the zone is zoned estate, and that's four units per acre. Is that correct? Under the current future land use and zoning for all that property, all out there, it's four units per acre, the maximum permitted. And, Part of and the property is zoned R1A, which is four units an acre. Part of it's under an existing PUD. The northern part of this property is under an existing PUD that was from 2006 or 7 that had both townhouses and single family in it. And I want to say that number was 135, give or take, acres and a couple of hundred houses and about 100 plus townhomes. I don't remember the exact numbers, but part of the property that we're talking about tonight is already zoned in a PUD. And then part of it is a standard straight zoning R1A. And, and, I, and I was kind of going, if it's already future land, four units per acre as an estate, and we PUD, and I think um, the representative said it was three point something. Three point three. Three point three. So, so actually with the PUD, it's actually less housing than it would be with the current future with the four. Potentially. Potentially. Potentially, yes. Okay, so I guess uh, my question, and, ju and just for me, um, for those that are here, um, we've kind of been looking at the growth of Leesburg for, for many years. Um, we've been kind of excluded from the growth of family homes. Uh, we've had our, our share of 55-plus uh, for Austin Ridge, Legacy, Highland Lakes. Um, we didn't have many families moving into Leesburg. Um, so personally, um, I encourage, uh, I'm excited about family-oriented homes coming to our city to diversify the housing in, um, in, into our city. So um, hand over, I looked at some of the developments and they do build a quality development. And we mentioned Lake Denham t tonight. Um, I think someone mentioned that they're not complete. They just start building. And, and I, I actually know a family who works for, for my company um, and they actually was able to buy their first home um, due to um, down payment assistance from the developer. So I think when large developers come to our city, they do afford the opportunity for people who live in Leesburg. And these people are actually moving from Lady Lake into Leesburg. So uh, for me personally, um, growth is going to happen. We, we in 27 in the Turnpike hit between Claremont and Leesburg, growth is going to explode with the villages coming. Um, development's going to come retail, and people want to be around retail and jobs. We heard that earlier. Um, so it's almost inevitable that growth's going to come down 27. Um, is this the right development? You know, I can't say, um, but I think I'm, I'm kind of I'm impressed by what Hanover has done and worked with the city and the county um, to alleviate some of the concerns that happened in October um, that were discussed. So, um, Dan, I, I thank you and the staff. I thank you work. We, we I think you've already looked at the traffic study and environmental study. You, your staff, our staff should have already looked at that. Have you looked at that, Dan? We have received traffic study that goes on to Lake County. Lake County brought back comments. Okay. Any comments that Lake County gives us become a part of the PUD because of the way the city of Leesburg words its PUDs. So if Lake County says they need two turn lanes or a stoplight or whatever, in the PUD, our wording says that we will follow Lake County's direction. If during, and this is for any PUD, not just this one. So if during the course of the development, there's an issue where they have to come back and do an additional we say it's this is what Lake County told you. It's a Lake County road, and our PUD says that's what has to be done. Okay. We word it that way so that if there are changes in the future where they get down and do engineering into the ground and find that there's a problem where they have to shift an entrance a few feet this way or that, it's covered. Okay. So that's that's how that works. So Lake County, so Lake County got precedence pretty much over the road. Absolutely. Turn signal. So that's not, and if, and it's not Lake, a, our thing. It's a Lake County. Either. That's correct. And if Lake County says they want something done, then we take that and put it in our files and it becomes part of the PUD essentially because of our wording. Thank you, sir. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Hello. I'm sorry. Um, I'm Jill Thompson. I'm from Mialaha and I live in the Bloomfield subdivision. 
um, I, I thought this was a question section, not the question and, and the comment section at the same time. I would just like to say thank you for your service to the commissioners. Um, my first question before I keep talking, <laughs> have you guys made a decision yet? On this property? Yes, ma'am. No, that's why it's on the agenda tonight. Okay, all right. So then I'll, I'll proceed then. Uh, I'm a lifelong uh, resident of Florida. I've lived here all my life. I'm from Fort Lauderdale. I don't want to live there. <laughs> um, I work in Orlando. I don't want to live there. Um, I commute every day to Orlando to work. The traffic is insane in Orlando. Um, I've been in Yalaha for approximately five years. And I used to ride my bike on 48 when I first moved here. Um, I don't do that anymore. I'm deathly afraid because there's so many trucks and so much traffic. Five years ago, we didn't have that on 48. So now I move my bike route to the number two road. And right now the number two road is lovely. It's beautiful. There are no sidewalks and there are no bike trails. And I don't know if any of the plans include that for these areas um, because right now it's a peaceful, lovely place There's to ride your bike. There's lots of cows and, and farm animals and it's just beautiful and serene, it's gorgeous. Um, so I moved here from Ocala um, and I spent most of my life up in Ocala, Florida, which is really a lovely area. And um, the way that they've done their growth is very, very smart. I know the villages came into Ocala a long, like probably 20 years ago or more. It's been quite some time. But when the villages first came in, they, they leveled everything. And then they started having a lot of sinkholes in the villages. So the newer part of the villages, they're now building that and they're preserving the natural habitat. They're preserving the wetlands. They're leaving it the way Florida was meant to be. Um, I don't see the subdivision doing that. It, it sounds like they're making man-made artificial um, retention ponds. Um, I live on an acre and I have a small lot for my area. Most of my neighbors have five or 10 acres. Um, if, if this becomes another Orlando, Claremont, we will move. We, we won't stay here. And that's why we're here, is to give our three minutes. I'm kind of nervous because I don't normally speak in this type of setting. Um, but I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for letting me have a second time. Um, my husband and I moved to Oregon and I saw a house that the builder had for sale. I didn't care what it looked like inside because it was inside of a Douglas fir forest. It had the most beautiful trees all around it. And I would like to see some of these homes, instead of clear cutting all the property, have some of those trees left so that there is that sense of outdoors beauty. The other thing that I would like to see is instead of removing all the trees between our properties, to leave the tall, beautiful pine trees because we can see them from our neighborhood. I live in Highland Lakes on Racket Circle. I'm on the swamp side, but or the wetland side, excuse me, but I can still see the trees from my front yard and they're beautiful. I know that the board, the boards that would be, you know, come from those trees are worth a lot of money to the builder, but I would also like to think that they would think that it was worth a lot to the homeowners. Instead of tearing them down, build some of them inside those tree forests. People will buy those homes just because they're beautiful and leave some for us in Highland Lakes so that we have that quiet zone. Those trees will absorb a lot of noise from children playing, and also it'll give a lot of oxygen back to the country. 
Thank you. Hello. My name is John Crane. My wife and I just purchased a place at Highland Lakes. And one of the big selling points, or buying points, was that little patch of woods out back. You got Lake Denham going up the road. Leesburg just sold a bunch of land to the villages. I don't think you need to strip everything we got. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. I don't know if everyone's had a chance to speak, but I thought I would just take this opportunity to come back up and try to respond to a few of the things and hopefully reiterate a couple of things in the presentation. Um, I just want to remind everyone that it is an active agricultural operation. It's planted pine trees on the site. The majority of the site is planted pine trees. The remainder of the site is open pasture land. There's not a lot of oak trees on the property. Um, I know that Hanover will try to save large oak trees along County Road 48 and Number 2 Road uh, to help with screening and to, I mean, it, it's, it's a great amenity for their own neighborhood, so they recognize the value in that. Uh, we will coordinate with Florida Fish Wildlife Commission as far as any listed species go, but as of today, the environmental assessment has only identified gopher tortoise burrows on the property, so those will be relo relocated in accordance with those guidelines. Sorry? There, um, the Lake County, I'm sorry, the Lake Express Transit System does not currently serve this area, so providing any sort of designated public system access point uh, doesn't really serve any purpose at this point. And along those same lines, this location really isn't very suitable for affordable housing as there is no access to public transit. Uh, so primary market housing for family-oriented neighborhood is the best, highest use of the property. We are accommodating on-street parking within our neighborhood, and it's actually a really good thing because it creates a yield condition when vehicles are driving down the street. It makes it safer for pedestrians, safer for kids playing outside. And um, lastly, let's see, the video that was mentioned, um, we have had an opportunity to view it as well. It did list a number of inaccuracies in there. I do have um, a spreadsheet that outlines those inaccuracies. If the commission would like to see it, I can, I can hand it out. Um, and then I just want to reiterate that we have met every policy and requirement in the comp plan and in the land development code. For the, con for the future land use amendment and the rezoning. If we didn't, staff would not make a recommendation of approval. Um, so appreciate your time. Uh, looking forward to an approval vote. And I have those spreadsheets. Do you, are you adding sidewalks to this development? I'm sidewalks. Sorry? Are you adding sidewalks? Yes, there are sidewalks yes. on all streets. Thank you. Yes. Commissioners, any other comments? Well, I'd just um, like to echo some of Commissioner Christian's thoughts. You know, we, we've spent, you know, mentioned earlier, we're about to spend $5 million on an aquatic complex. We've spent $15 million on the Venetian Gardens area. Uh, we're getting ready to build a, a teen center. Uh, we're spending a lot of money on family-friendly amenities in Leesburg because one of the the biggest thing we get, uh, at least comments I get, is we want more families in Leesburg. So I do sympathize with the the, uh, the residents living on five and ten acres. Um, you know, I, I was privileged to, to grow up in, in a rural area of Leesburg at the time, and uh, it's something I really enjoyed. But the fact of the matter is, uh, b due to things outside of the city's control, uh, county level impact fees being one of them, uh, cost of labor, you can't, you know, the idea that everyone can have five to 10 acres in, in a single family home, you're just pricing everyone out of the market. There, there are very few people that can afford that. And when you look at the type of people that, that, that work in Leesburg and that would love to own their own home, this is, this is the product that enables them to do that. So um, I would uh, commend staff for working with the developer and bringing this to us. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, discussion is over. This is to see whether or not we're going to annex this property into the city rather than being county. Roll call, please. Commissioner Roebuck? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. 
Mayor Dennison. Yes. Okay, this just meant that we're annexed into Leesburg. That's all we just discussed. Okay, would somebody introduce 6E, please? I'll introduce and ask to be read by title only. An ordinance amending the comprehensive plan of the city of Leesburg, Florida, changing the future land use map designation of certain property containing 0 0.17 plus minus acres for property generally located south of County Road 48 and west of Number 2 Road, as legally described in Section 18, Township 20 South, Range 25 East, Lake County, Florida, and providing an effective date. Move for approval. Second. Any more discussion on this? This is changing the zoning from county rural to city of Leesburg estate. Roll call, please. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Commissioner Roebuck? Yes. Mayor Dennison? Yes. 6F, would somebody introduce, please? I'll introduce and ask to be read by title only. An ordinance of the city of Leesburg, Florida, changing the zoning of approximately 164.56 acres from city of Leesburg R1A single family residential, A agriculture, and Lake County R1 rural residential to city of Leesburg PUD planned unit development for property generally located south of County Road 48 and west of Number 2 Road as legally described in sections 18 and 19 Township 20 South, Range 25 East, Lake County, Florida, and providing an effective date. Move for approval. Second. Roll call, please. Oh, sorry, um, yep. Mayor. I did want to, you, since you addressed the rumors earlier, I did think that maybe I should just address the one that was emailed to us uh, this oh, afternoon. Yes, please. That uh, my uh, brother uh, has a financial interest in Hanover. And uh, the fact that I have a brother would be pretty big news to me, but uh, <laughs> I, I just would want to let everyone know that, that neither myself nor any of my relatives have any involvement with uh, Hanover or any of their associated companies. So thanks. Thank you. I guess that was the same person who had me living elsewhere. Must be. <laughs> with my brother, maybe. <laughs> I missed that one. Roll call. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Commissioner Roebuck? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Mayor Dennison. Yes. Six F. Would somebody introduce, please? I introduce and recommend read by title only. An ordinance of the City of Leesburg, Florida, amending Section 25-474 of the Code of Ordinances pertaining to installation of electrical service service lines, amending subsection C and E of Section 25-474. Wait a second, are we on 6F? We just did F. Oh, okay, thank you. Adding subsection F, permitting extensions of the time allowed for developers to obtain reimbursement for the cost of overhead electrical service lines in approved developments, specifying conditions which would justify extension of the deadline by the city commission in its discretion providing a procedure and timetable for developers to seek an extension, repealing conflicting ordinances, providing a savings clause, and providing an effective date. Motion to approve. Move for approval. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Roebuck? Yes. Commissioner Christian? Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Yes. Mayor Dennison? Yes. Could we wait a minute, please, until the, the noise stops? For those of you still in the room, don't forget we are getting all these surveys for you. They will be on the website and we will continue working with the developer to make sure some of these issues, primarily the, uh, the uh, trees, the wildlife and everything else is watched, okay? Yes, please, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, where were we? <laughs> H. Okay, somebody introduce H, please. This is the first reading. I'll introduce House Bureau by title only. <clears throat> An ordinance of the city of Leesburg, Florida, rezoning approximately 2.0 plus minus acres from city CIP commercial industrial plan to city SPUD small planned unit development to allow for the development of offices or storage space 
for property located south of south street and west of gator pond lane as legally described in section twenty seven township nineteen south range twenty four east lake county florida and providing an effective date this is the first reading any discussion on this second reading will be august twenty fourth six i please somebody introduce yeah, hello. Uh, I'll introduce about that only. only. Thank you. An ordinance of the city of Leesburg, Florida, amending the zoning on approximately 0 0.22 plus minus acres to add a planned development overlay to allow office uses in an R3 high density residential zoning district for property generally located south of East Main Street and west of Mike Street as legally described in section 25 Township 19 South, Range 24 East, Lake County, Florida, and providing an effective date. Any discussion? This is first reading. Okay, uh, second reading will be August 24th. Informational reports, none. City attorney items. Nothing tonight, Mayor. City manager items. Yeah, let me um, bring just two things to your attention. Uh, one, Mayor, you brought up the, the budget issues. Um, so let me revisit that with y'all real quick. And then I had put one on the budget to, okay. to talk with, or, or to put one on the budget, put one in the agenda to talk to you about just to get some updates. Uh, so so uh, as we move through the budget process, I came up with four things that we did need to talk about. One, we talked about the health care costs. Um, I have Jim Williams working on a program for that, for which I think will probably be fiscal year 22 or later in fiscal year 21 before you could um, work into that. Second was the write-offs, and we'll keep you up to speed on that. Uh, third, you all wanted an update on the community grant stuff, which we'll revisit um, when you approve the community grants. Um, and then the fourth thing, which was my item, uh, the, the program that we put together was um, pretty, I think, pretty informative. We talked about the capital improvement projects and basically they're just being a couple. I left one out inadvertently, which is in the budget. So I wanted to bring that to your attention prior to September when you go over that. And that was we did put $400,000 of city money in there for the 441 landscaping grant. So the big capital projects would be um, the, the Market Street um, concepts to start designing the um, uh, gateway down here at this intersection and this project. So that was $400,000 of our cash, which we took from stormwater matched with uh, uh, um, an FDOT grant. And that would do um, 441 from Airport Boulevard to um, 44 Sunnyside that section to continue that project along. So if that is something you guys want to scrap or you want to do, let me know. We'll revisit that when, when we approve the budget. And I remembered one more thing uh, in the budget process. Um, and we, 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 we touched on it, but I don't remember a resolution. That was the police uh, body cameras, which, which I'm against. Yeah, we were going to bring that one back to you. Okay. So okay. We, that's on hold. Okay. That was not a budgeted item. I didn't know. Okay. We were going to shift around I allocations. We were more is my point. Yeah, okay. Hicks is doing putting some homework together for that for y'all, and we'll do we'll workshop that item. Um, and then the the last thing, uh, also tonight, we brought up Ski Beach. So I don't have the final answer, and I didn't have my wits about me when we asked that question. Um, so the good part of that is that cost has already been spent to extend infrastructure to the restaurant site. So there's actually three pieces of that formula that we would have to do, and that would be how much did it cost in the Evergreen contract to extend an eight inch water line. We looped the site. And, and so from that fire hydrant to that oak tree, about 400 feet, that cost would, I think you could probably tag as an extension cost. But then I think you, there's some fluff in there because part of the concept of this facility was to develop it in concert with the commercial development. So we, we kind of, when we did this facility, we took that financial gamble. The second cost is the sewer main. Uh, so it would be that lift station or that manhole, which is in front of that oak tree, over to that lift station. So that would be the second cost. Again, the same concepts. And then the third cost is the lift station. So the lift station that we put in is sized large enough to handle this facility and the restaurant. So there is some cost in that. Um, 
but they're they're negligible. So you've got those costs, and I'll and I'll get you a better um, lag at what those are based on our evergreen contract costs. So we'll go back and we'll try to extrapolate that number from the as built. Um, and then, so you have that cost, and don't send in the two revenue sources, the impact fees and the tap fees. So there's a couple extra thousand bucks that's going to be wrapped up in that on money that you've already spent. So on this, where we're looking at subsidizing those impact fees, which is an existing policy, that money's already spent on the premise of the develop the multi-use concept here. So that money's actually coming back to replenish us. Not a whole lot. Remember the, the site plan development cost was 1.5 million or so, somewhere between 1.5 2 million, just to do the site work here. So that's a little better answer. I'll get the exact numbers um, as soon as you asked that and we moved on. It, I thought of it. Can I ask just a quick question? Uh, we saw the site plan on the pool. Uh, we, we are moving forward with condemnation on the two yep, properties to the north. Correct. Fred's working on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's it. Sir, are you just leaning or would you like to say something? Yeah, I just have a procedural question. Yes. Maybe, maybe Fred could answer very quickly. Um, how many days from the decision tonight uh, is the actual decision in rolls? What is the period of time we could appeal? 30 days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Okay, roll call, please. Nothing tonight. Nothing tonight. Mr. Christian. I'd like to just um, say thank you to the council and city staff for their kind words, cards. Um, I'm doing the pass on my father, so I just want to thank all of you for your support and kind words. And let's keep um, Commissioner Hurley in our prayers and, and his family. Um, and everybody, just please stay safe. That's all I have. Thank you. Mayor Dennison. Yeah, I came across a little rough tonight, but um, I, I'm tired of hearing how we're missing information, and uh, I never did business that way internationally. I want all the facts before we make a decision, and I'd like to see this property, since there was so many people from Highland Lakes. Um, I'd like to make sure that we work with the builder on this to try to make it as easy as possible for everybody. Um, that's all for me. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, can I have one more point? Um, to Al, I, I think you, we all got an email from the Richardson family. Um, Hayward Richardson was the owner of a property on Miss Paul, and I guess we got code enforcement action on them. Um, Hayward, Pastor Hayward Richardson died a, a few months ago. His wife uh, assumed responsibility of the church, so I guess it was a, a lax in um, maintaining the property. I don't know if they went to the special master, but I think they still got fined $100 a day. So anyway, we can see if we can help them speed up, see what's, where there was a, a mishap in communication um, during the death of, of the pastor and, um, and the mother assuming the responsibility to try to maintain the house. Yeah, I, I've already addressed that with, with Richardson, Mr. Richardson. Okay. Um, I talked with uh, Chief Hicks and with Riley Snively, our Chief Code Enforcement Officer today. Uh, there, his situation was hinged on uh, the uh, unpermitted work, which okay. I'm sure was done inadvertently, you know, that happens. And the building department's pretty, pretty forgiving, it has a lot of forgiveness about that. Essentially, the key is just go back to the building department and get your permits. Okay. So once he gets his permits and gets that information to the special magistrate, the fines will stop okay. back to when he pulled his permits, which is pretty recent. So I reached out to Ann, the building official, Ann Kinsley, to have him, uh, to have her send an email to the family. They did, and I believe he got, he picked up his permit today. Okay. So with that information, he'll be able to go back to the special magistrate, stop the fines, and then focus on the work. All right. So Thank I you. think we got that one under control. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You were good? Okay. Move to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. We are adjourned. Al, what time was that I said for <laughs> the